Good evening. I'm Dean Alp Özerdem, the new Dean of ESCAR, and it's a great honor to welcome you all to uh, this event this evening to ESCAR's 30th annual Lynch Lecture. And despite of the big game tonight, everybody is talking about, it's great to see so many of you actually turned up. So it's really wonderful. And, and I really appreciate that you are part of this lecture. And uh, on behalf of George Mason University, my faculty and I would love to uh, uh, thank you for, for your support. So before we start, there are a few things that I'd like to do. And the first thing is really to uh, recognize a number of key important people here. And I want to start with the Lynch family. The faculty, staff, students, and friends of Eskar are enormously grateful to the Lynch family for their friendship, generosity, dedication, and support to us over the last 30 years. And in a way, I think uh, School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution has grown with the Lynch family, with their support. Secondly, I'd like to thank and acknowledge Edward and Nancy Rice. Uh, they are here, they are long-term friends of ESCAR. Edward is also a member of Mason Board Visitors and also a member of our advisory board. And I must say, I go and get his advice quite often. And also, we have a number of people here from ESCAR advisory board. Could I just ask you to raise your hands, please, ESCAR advisory board? Few people. And let's thank those people for the wonderful work they do. Because to run ESCAR, you really need different partners and help as much as possible. And ESCAR advisory board uh, is a great resource for me as dean and for, for all of us at school. Uh, next, I'd like to acknowledge and thank Dr. Kevin Avruk, my predecessor, and, uh, and really for looking after ESCAR so well over the last six years and handing over such a wonderful institution to me. I think ESCAR went from strength to strength under your leadership, and I know it's kind of really big shoes to fill in for me, but thanks very much for all you did over the last six years. There are a few people uh, who I, uh, I would like to acknowledge, and Dr. Susan Hirsch, our current Lynch uh, chair, whom you'll hear from just in a few moments. Uh, I don't know whether she is here, but uh, Dr. Sandra Sheldolin, former Lynch chair. Uh, she's our professor emerita. And uh, so th there's a tradition here. We have a number of uh, Lynch chairs, and they take the button from one to another, and continuing this tradition of sport over the last 30 years. Now, next I want to acknowledge ESCAR faculty and staff. Um, they, I think, sit in the first two rows. And uh, if you raise your hands, that would be really great so that people could see you. But ultimately, these people, now, I arrived here only two months ago. And it's great to have wonderful faculty and staff who are supporting you. And from the bottom of my heart, I'd like to thank all of them for being such a wonderful faculty and, and staff, making ESCAR such a special place. Thank you very much. Now, the next category is like Oscars, aren't they? <laughs> the next category is ESCAR students and alumni. And I know that number of you are here, so can I see the hands, the students first? Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> and how about alumni? Great. I think it's a wonderful uh, place to be, and we are so proud of our alumni. And, uh, and as I will explain in a minute, uh, you know, I have some plans uh, with the alumni, you know, things to do. So uh, last but not least, I'd like to welcome and, uh, and acknowledge our distinguished speaker and one of the founding fathers of the restorative justice, Dr. Havertseer, 
It's great to welcome you here at ESCAR, and uh, we are very proud of the fact that we are working with you and for you to be here to, uh, as our keynote speaker. It's a fantastic opportunity for us. Thank you very much. Right, now, I've done my the, uh, introductions. Let me just say a few words. Uh, and considering this is my first Lynch lecture, so you are going to hear like next five, ten minutes from me, I'm afraid. I'm going to use my opportunity, take the executive power of Dean to speak. <laughs> now, tonight marks the 30th anniversary of the Lynch lecture series, and I think 30 years is a long time to be committed to something. And those who are married here know exactly what I'm talking about. And these last 30 years are significant in the history of ESCAR because they signify a long relationship and a shared vision of promoting peace, which I'm honored to continue during my tenure. I started my term, as I said, only two months ago. So let me just say a few words about ESCAR and why I think ESCAR is such a special place to study and research in peace and conflict studies. In our troubled world, the ability to effectively analyze both the dynamics of conflict and the trajectories of peace is a must for the realization of the global objectives set by the UN Sustainable Goal number 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. <laughs> to achieve the objectives of SDG 16, at ESCAR, we aim to maximize the positive and transformational effects of conflict while minimizing the destructive, distorting, uh, negative ones. Our school aspires to have a transformative impact on conflict-affected societies across the world through its creative teaching, innovative research, and participatory engagement with non-academic partners uh, uh, in different parts of the world. Now, with our established history of nearly 40 years of research and practice in real world politics and conflicts, we lead peace and conflict studies with our premier faculty and research students. And for us, ESCAR is home for research excellence with impact. Moreover, ESCAR embodies what is best about George Mason University. We are equally committed to access and excellence by opening doors for students who want to make a positive impact in the world. Teaching conflict resolution at all degree levels from undergraduate to masters and PhD, ESCA prepares graduates to engage in conflicts ranging from workplace disputes and local conflict resolution challenges to international peace building and reconciliation. We're also very proud of our 2,000 strong alumni community who apply their education and training to careers in government service, in the private sector, and in the nonprofit and public service sectors, including many of the leading NGOs in peacemaking and peace building. And many of our alumni have, in fact, expanded the discipline by developing new conflict analysis and resolution curricula for the academic community in the US and beyond. And to be honest, that's not very good in the sense that that means competition for ESCAR. <laughs> but what can we do? They are so good and they go and you know, start new programs. So that's a reality. We are very proud of them. And, and the majority of programs in peace and conflict studies in many countries are really the product of our alumni. So none of these achievements, though, could be realized without you. So many of you have been part of and supported ESCAR for a long time. And as the new dean, I'm eager to continue to work together. It's my mission to explore opportunities that will help, will, will help uh, take ESCAR to the next level in the field of conflict analysis and resolution. With nearly 40 years as a leader in research and practice, ESCAR will continue to build upon its history and be home for new and innovative ideas and inspire a new generation of peace-building leaders 
to make a positive impact around the world. And as we evolve, I'm excited with the many possibilities of ESCAR having a greater focus on justice and expanding into other areas of dispute resolution and peace building in the near future. At ESCAR, we strive to balance our shared responsibilities, leading in the development of new theory, research, and practice, and serving as the training ground for the next generation of thought leaders and practitioners. So I'm thrilled about the future of ESCAR and hope that you will join me in continuing this important work for the goal of preventing conflict, conflicts and building just and peaceful societies. Thank you. So now uh, I'd like to introduce our Lynch Chair, Dr. Susan Hirsch, uh, to continue with the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alp, and thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, it's really wonderful to see all the alumni and students, my colleagues, uh, friends of SCAR. It's really a great, uh, a great um, crowd, and uh, especially we enjoyed having a networking reception for undergrad alums and current students just prior to this event tonight. So it's great to have so many people associated with the undergrad program here. So as Alp mentioned, tonight marks the 30th anniversary of the Lynch Lecture, and that makes it especially wonderful to have so many people in the room to celebrate with us. For me, it's been a real honor to hold the Lynch chair. I'm grateful to the Lynch family for their generosity to SCAR and for sponsoring this lecture every year. I too want to recognize uh, Sandy Sheldon, our previous Lynch chair, for providing me such a great role model. Uh, my last thanks go to the team that worked really hard uh, to get this event up and running. Um, Maria, Paul, Eve, Audrey, Leslie, Mercedes, Jay, and many other volunteers who came out this evening, including undergrad ambassadors. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks uh, to everybody who made, made this happen. So in these first years of my tenure as Lynch Chair, my activities are focused around the theme of justice. Much of what I've always done as a researcher, teacher, and practitioner falls into the broad realm of justice. And my aim, working with ESCAR colleagues and students and friends of ESCAR, is to expand ESCAR's attention to justice in our collective efforts to understand and address conflict. The conflict literature frequently invokes peace as an end goal of intervention. Yet I would argue that the conflict field can and should champion justice as a guiding value even as it often remains an unrealized ideal. In striving toward justice in our work, many of us refuse a narrow, predefined notion of justice as primarily punitive or retributive. Instead, justice must be capacious, healing, forward-looking, and versatile. Tonight's speaker, Professor Howard Zaer, has long encouraged people to look at justice differently, to change lenses, as he so aptly urged in the title of his first and groundbreaking book on restorative justice. His scholarship has persistently extended our view of justice beyond the familiar notions of accountability and even fairness to embrace values that lay the ground for constructive outcomes, giving respect, taking responsibility, and restoring and repairing relationships, the three R's that Professor Zaire has emphasized throughout his influential career. I couldn't be more pleased to have Professor Zaire here tonight to deliver the 2019 Lynch Lecture. He's a foundational figure in restorative justice, responsible for developing key approaches like circle processes and defense-based victim assistance, <laughs> 
that latter being an initiative that I found very, very helpful in my own personal and professional life. Many students here tonight have read his little book of restorative justice, which has really proliferated globally. Few of us will have the satisfaction of seeing an approach that we developed extend across institutions worldwide. In many juvenile courts, schools, and other institutions where punishment was the go-to response, restorative justice provides a new forward-looking lens. Just outside the auditorium, you'll find table displays highlighting restorative justice initiatives in the DC metro area, and these are really growing. Now, restorative justice is not without its critics, especially given its recent rapid proliferation and given its expansion into institutions where systemic inequalities challenge any quest in the name of justice. Yet Professor Zare is among its critics, having worked to build the field of restorative justice quite admirably. He has been deeply reflective and insightful about how to make it better. And I'm sure we're gonna to hear tonight about ways in which he has extended and rethought the foundational work that he did in, in restorative justice. Let me mention his credentials. Professor Zare is a graduate of Morehouse College, the University of Chicago, and Rutgers University. As a longtime faculty member at Eastern Mennonite University, he was instrumental in positioning EMU as a center for studying peace and justice. His accomplishments are reflected in the Zare Institute for Restorative Justice at Eastern Mennonite University. Since I announced that Professor Zare would deliver this year's Lynch Lecture, some of his former students, his colleagues, and his friends have reached out to me to express their joy that Escar is honoring him. In speaking of their cherished mentor and colleague, they use adjectives like energetic, humble, brilliant, inspiring, caring, and life-changing. Some have told me stories about his strong commitment to feminism, anti-racism, and reform of the US prison system. I'm grateful for your work, and I am among those who are inspired by it. Professor Zare's title tonight is Human Rights Meets Restorative Justice. So please join me in thanking Professor Zare for coming and welcoming him to deliver his talk. Well, thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Some of it's even true. <laughs> <laughs> you have to figure out which is not, I guess. I'm really honored to be here tonight. Uh, you know, I've heard so much about SCAR over the years from my colleagues who graduated here, from my students who've gone here, and yet I've never been here. This is my, this is my first time here, I think. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. I'm also, I'm honored, but I'm also intimidated. Uh, you know, speakers aren't usually advised to start out this way, but I have to admit, I have quite a bit of trepidation speaking of, about a topic that, on which a lot of you know much more than I do. I'm also aware, and I think about this a lot, of the limited and biased perspective I bring as an older European-American male in this world. Or as a very young nurse wrote on my chart, medical chart, already 15 years ago, an elderly white male in no acute distress. <laughs> <laughs> the latter might not be true tonight, I'm not sure. The only reason I have a nerve to talk about this at all is that a number of years ago, a human rights organization gave me an award and asked me to speak on this topic. And if they laughed, they were, they were gracious enough not to do it in front of me. So uh, I hope you'll extend me the same grace tonight. The previous talk occurred on the anniversary 
of the Selma Civil, uh, the Selma March, Civil Rights March, and the resulting Vot uh, Voting Rights Act. Both of those are symbol symbolically and substantive, extremely important. Both of them are under attack these days. The events of those years meant a lot of us, a lot to of us who lived through them. But I can imagine those of you who are younger probably have a hard time imagining what it was like in those days. I was in the South during some of that time. Uh, I was a student at historically African American College, Morehouse College, in the early and mid 60s, graduated in 66. And then in the 70s, I taught in another historically black college, Talladega College in Alabama. And as a young European American man, I only had a glimpse of what it must have been like to live through that. But I learned much from my peers. I learned a lot about justice and injustice. I learned about privilege and what it's like not to have privilege. And I learned a lot about what it feels like to, be, to live as a minority. In many ways, we've come a long way, but the legacy of the past remains. It's not just the ongoing racism, but that's become all too obvious in the last few years. We're now realizing how past traumas play out historically through our lives and from our past. We've made a lot of progress, but him, history does not unfold in a linear fashion. My PhD is in European history, by the way. It doesn't unfold in a linear pass, uh, pattern, and it's not all progress. We see loops of regression. We Some things don't change, and some things go backwards. Moreover, all interventions, no matter how well we intend them, go astray, they backfire, they have unintended consequences. Racial injustice remains deeply embedded in our society, but in some ways it's become more subtle and more paradoxical. What my colleagues and friends often call the criminal legal system has become one of the prime arenas for racial injustice, and we've tried many interventions often with unintended consequences. Mandatory sentences and the just desserts philosophy that we're living with today came in part out of an effort to ad address the inequity and the racism that was embedded in our system. Instead, it drove it from public view into the prosecutor's office and places where it's much less accountable. As Michelle Alexander has said in her important, important book, The New Jim Crow, Racial injustice has gone underground, but shows up in race-neutral language. Because of this and other factors in the 20th century, new, new questions are arising about what we mean by human rights, what we mean by justice. As a sidebar, let me say a bit about how I came to human rights and racial justice. My experiences at Morehouse College and Talladega were formative. I'm often asked how I ended up there, and one of the memories I have is uh, Dr. Vincent Harding. Some of you may then know him, may then know the name. He died just a few years ago. Uh, Dr. Harding was one of Dr. King's advisors. He was the author, the speechwriter for that speech, that famous speech on Vietnam that King made. He was a guest in our home several times when I was a young man, junior high or high school. And I have very vivid memories of sitting at the kitchen table while he tried to help this naive young white guy understand something about justice. And it's partly because of Vincent that I ended up at Morehouse. That's where I got my real taste and my real feel for justice issues. And then in Alabama, while I was teaching there, I got involved with others in working with prisoners and working with defense teams in helping to select juries for cases like police brutality cases, prison riot cases, death penalty cases. I came away from that with a realization of the importance of rights, but also a very critical perspective on the criminal legal system and its failure to enforce these rights in, in a way that was fair. Later, though, I came to realize that my critique of that system was not nearly basic enough, and that led me to restorative justice. Then my international travels, my international students all helped me become more aware of the, of the importance of human rights issues and the challenges facing it. 
And there are challenges. I came to realize more and more the challenges that face the human rights efforts. It's not as simple as we often assume. Often we kind of assume that the human rights are a universal concept of what, that there's a un universal concept of what is human and what is right. But how do we define hu human rights? On what basis do we consider human rights universal? How Western is the concept? How much is it based in an individualistic worldview? or a simplistic free will concept of human, of human action. My friend Chris Marshall, professor and leader of Restorative Justice Center in New Zealand, wrote, wrote in his little book on human rights, whether human rights canons are truly universal principles or are merely Western cultural values masquerading as universal principles. He asked that question. At minimum, we often see human rights being articulated in Western terms with Western culture baggage that makes the message hard to hear in other contexts. So to what extent do we and must we take into account the cultural context and how does that impact human rights? And then how do we promote and enforce human rights? We often use shame and humiliation to try to enforce human rights, but that often backfires. James Gilligan has written that the primary motor of violence, the primary thing that drives violence is shame. John Braithwaite wrote in his landmark book in the 80s that shame is often stigmatizing. The way we use shame in our criminal justice systems, in our schools and so forth, is what he calls stigmatizing shame. And when we stig stigmatize people through shame, that we label them as bad, they become the outsider, they join with other outsiders. They invert the values so that what we say is good, they say is bad and vice versa. The results with this kind of shame are anger and, as I said, outsider status, inversion of value, and often a sense of victimhood. I often think of the former paramilitary prisoner from Northern Ireland in my class who said the more people tried to shame us, the more it gave us resolve to continue. Braithwaite, in that book, argued that shame can be reintegrative if you impose it and manage it properly. But the recent research, I think, is pretty convincing that shame is a highly dangerous emotion or motivator. You have to be really careful about imposing it. And there are other dynamics, such as apology and forgiveness and empathy, that are actually more powerful. That, I think, has significant implications for how we try to enforce human rights. We often rely on a punitive criminal justice approach, but like shame, punishment is often counterproductive. It produces a sense of anger. It, presents, uh, it produces a sense of victimhood in the person. It, it turns them into outsiders. James Gilligan, the same person who wrote about shame, says that punishment decreases guilt and responsibility, but increases shame. Think about that. Punishment decreases guilt and responsibility, but increases shame, and he argues that shame is the primary motivator of violence. Then there's a the nature of the adversarial process that tends to re reinforce the neutralizing strategies, the excuses and rationalizations that people use to do what they did in the first place. After all, our basic principle is make the state prove it. So instead of being encouraged to understand what you did and take responsibility, you are encouraged to deny it. And that's not to mention this almost total neglect of those who are victimized. There's another problem, and that is the focus on individual decisions doesn't take into account the full context of human action. I really like Philip Zimbardo's book, The Lucifer Effect. If you had sociology classes, you'll remember, you'll remember the Zimbardo experiment. I see some of you nodding your heads. Back in the 60s when he, he randomly chose uh, college students and <coughs> called some of them guards and some of them prisoners and tried to re recreate a little prison and it went, it went so real so quick they had to stop it. Uh, later, he was one of the consultants in some of the uh, trials around the Abu Ghraib prison abuses. He concludes these kind of things could happen to any of us given the right situations and structures. 
Here's a quote. A full understanding of the dynamics of human behavior requires that we recognize the extent and limits of personal power, situational power, and systemic power. Our legal system focuses on the first one, personal power and the choices we make. But he says there are two other factors, situational power and systemic power. The pervasive yet subtle power of a host of situational variables can dominate the individual's will to resist. And then he says, any deed that any human being has ever committed, however horrific, is possible for any of us under the right or wrong circumstances. That knowledge does not excuse evil, rather it democratizes it, sharing its blame among ordinary actors rather than declaring it the pro province of only deviants and despots of them and not us. That suggests a humility that we really need to embody. Where we come out on this depends partly on our worldview. And as my colleague and SCAR graduate, Jane Doherty, has written so convincingly, worldview is foundation. She's here tonight, too, so we can ask her questions about that later. If you want to. Uh, worldview is just so foundational. Ask yourself which of these metaphors best characterizes your own, or at least the American uh, mainstream worldview. Are we individuals responsible for our own destiny, turning to others only when we actually have to? That's the image embedded in our heroic, heroic figures. Independent, not relying on other people. For those of you old enough, think Yul Brenner, Clint Eastwood. We are, as Rupert Ross has written in his important book, Return to the Teaching, we are captains of our ship, plowing our way through the waves. Or are we part of a web of relationship where a movement in one part affects the other part, where we are connected to other people? That's the compact concept embedded in the Christian tradition originally, before it was subverted. That's the concept embedded in most indigenous cultures. That's the concept that was embedded in my indigenous history as a European originally. First Nation writer Val Napoleon has said, like the movement of billiard balls, human beings in the Western model of reality act in isolation, independently colliding and rebounding. It's characterized by interactions of individualistic worldviews in which the self is discrete and separate from the whole. So what, does human, what do human rights and what does justice mean in these two different metaphors? The criminal justice, the criminal legal system approach at least, certainly assumes the former. We are individuals making our own decisions, uh, captains of our ship. And so we need to ask to what extent is our concept of human rights embedded in this view? And what are the implications of that? The reality is, the reality is that we are not isolated, but we are interconnected. This is not, this is true sociologically, this is true psychologically, it's true neurologically. The latest research of modern, the latest findings of modern neuroscience boil down to this. We are wired to connect with each other. We are made to connect with each other. And that brings me to restorative justice. Restorative justice, in my view, is a relational understanding of justice. It's one that tries to balance concern for everybody involved, whether you've been harmed or whether you're causing the harm. It, it tries to respect the needs and roles of everyone. And that's with us that you saw pictures on the screen from some of my book projects, or one of those books I interviewed men and women serving life sentences, trying to present them as human beings so we'd have to listen to them without stereotypic judges, judgments. Another was victims of severe crime, again, trying to get us to listen to them and what their needs and perspectives are without prior judgments. And then the children whose parents are in prison and their needs. I'm not arguing, or I'm not even clear that restorative justice has a, has a lot of answers. But what it does do, I think, is to bring some new insights to this issue. My students who are human rights workers from around the world have said that restorative justice has caused them to rethink some of their assumptions about human rights and how one enforces and how one encourages them. Again, Michelle Alexander has said that criminal justice has become an instrument of racial injustice in seemingly race-neutral terms. And she argues 
that to address this and address the mass incarceration that's part of that, it's going to require some new ways of thinking, some new values, some new assumptions. And I think that's what restorative justice is about, an effort to get us to rethink some of those assumptions. Einstein is famous for saying you can't solve problems with the same thinking that got you into the problem. And I think that's the issue. So restorative justice is a relational understanding of wrongdoing and of justice. Or if I characterize it, I'll read this twice, just to, it's a relational approach to problems, conflicts, and harms that focuses on needs and responsibilities and puts a premium on engagement of and dialogue among stakeholders. I'll read that again and then I'll say more about it. It's a relational approach to problems, conflicts, and harms that focuses on needs and responsibilities, puts a premium on engagement and dialogue among those who have a stake in the situation. I like to say in the simplest term, restorative justice for, uh, is organized around three principles. The first one is the harms and needs. What really matters is the harms that have been done and the needs that reflow from that. So the first principle of restorative justice is addressing keeping central, addressing the harms and the needs that have come from that. The second principle is the ob principle of obligation. Whenever we do something to cause harm, we have an obligation. That obligation is to try to understand that and to make it as right as we can. So the second principle is the principle of obligation. And the third principle is the principle of engagement. Those people who have been infected by the, affected by this, who have a stake in this somehow, ought as much as possible to be part of the solution. So if you think about it as a way of changing, you mentioned changing lenses, changing questions. Our legal system, our school punishment systems tend to revolve around three questions. What laws or what rules were broken? Who did it? What do they deserve? If you're a defense attorney, for instance, that's a lot of what your life is about. Who did it? Uh, what laws are broken, who did it, what do they deserve? Restorative justice is about changing the question. Who's been hurt in this situation? What are their needs? Whose obligation is it to meet those needs? What are the causes of this situation? Who has a stake in this and what's the process they need to come to some resolution on this? It's a matter of changing questions. <clears throat> Many of the practice models of restorative justice, the ones that get TV notice and so forth, are those that allow those who have been harmed, who wish to do so, to meet the person that caused their harm in a facilitated process with lots of preparation and all of that. And those, those, are, those are wonderful processes. But there's lots of other applications of restorative justice, some of them completely restorative, some less so. I like to say restorative justice is a kind of continuum uh, that's guided by restorative justice principles. Some things, some situations aren't amenable to a, a really restorative process, but we can keep remembering who's been hurt, what are their needs, whose obligations are they, who needs to be part of this process, and so forth. And underlying these principles, again, are re the values that Susan mentioned. I think it's really important. I didn't talk about values a lot at the beginning, and then I began to realize you can follow the principles and still do some pretty terrible things. Uh, so I like to talk about three that start with R, because I'm really into things that I can remember, and maybe other people can remember too. Uh, one of them is respect. I really think it's, when I talk to so many people who have committed, who have committed harm, they have been trying to get respect in some way through their behavior. And then when we don't respect them through the process, no wonder, you know, just like violence begets, dis violence begets violence, disrespect begets disrespect. And when I talk to crime victims who've been through terrible things, part of their trauma is a disrespect they felt not just by the person who caused the harm, often by their loved ones who don't want to hear their anger or think they ought to forgive or that kind of thing, or the legal system that doesn't give them the support they need. I think there's one word that characterizes what justice ought to be, it's respect. Second is responsibility. We live in a society that focuses so much on rights and doesn't talk much about responsibility. Restorative justice is about the responsibilities that we have as individuals because of the third value, and that's relationships. We live in a web of relationships, and what I do affects other people, and therefore I need to be responsible for my actions when it affects other people in a negative way. So three, three values, respect, responsibility, relationship. 
I've come to believe, partly through my students who come from these situations, that in many ways, restorative justice is the best of indigenous processes combined with modern human rights sensibilities. So many of my students have told me of the traditions in their home cultures that were often repressed by the colonial legal system. And a lot of them sound pretty restorative. And it's really exciting to watch some of those go, students go back and use restorative justice as a way to revitalize and have a conversation about those traditions, some of which have, have been lost due again to the, to the legal system. This kind of approach to human rights may re, and, to, and to justice may require us to rethink a little bit our concept of rights. Krista Obald Eshelman, in the Notre Dame Journal of Law, Ethics, and Public Policy, called for a more restorative concept of rights to govern our legal system. She said it ought to be less adversarial, it ought to be more relational, and focus on rights and obligations of all parties involved. She suggests that the meaning and purpose of rights should be mutual promotion of the dignity of all, multiplying the power of each to arrive at transformation of a situation. Stanford Law Professor Herbert Parker has famously argued that there are two opposing justice orientations that govern US, US policy debates, the crime control versus the due process orientation. The crime control orientation puts its emphasis on order and security. Order is essential in society, so, represent, so repressing crime is the most important function of justice. This is best done by the certainty of punishment and by incapacitating people through prison. Police power should be broad so that crime can be aggressively addressed. Due process safeguards impede justice and should be minimal. Constitutional rights are often technicalities that interfere with justice in this view. Victims' rights are best addressed by convincing, convinc convicting, and punishing those who cause the harm. In this assumption, the system is basically reliable. If someone is charged and brought to trial, you can assume that they're probably guilty. So the focus of justice in the crime control orientation is on creating order by convicting and punishing or incapacitating the guilty. Now there's the opposite. Uh, orientation that we hear, and that's put its emphasis on preventing misuses of the punishment system. It says that personal freedoms and rights are more important than order. Because the state is so powerful, and mistakes and inequities are so likely, the consequences for defendants so dire, the most important function of the justice system is to safeguard rights through due process. Because of the above, and because the Bill of Rights specifically provides for it, emphasis should be on the defendants rather than victims' rights. Whether guilty or not, defendants should put the state to the proof, and make the state prove guilt. Police powers should be carefully limited and monitored to, provide, to prevent misuse. Constitutional rights are not mere technicalities, but rather a way to hold authorities accountable and to provide for fairness and dignity. The focus of justice is on safeguarding defendants and citizens' rights. Parts of those, I'm sure, sound familiar. These two orientations may be opposites, but they have some stuff in common. They have a number of assumptions that they both hold in common. That is that offender, offenses are defined more by laws breaking, by the laws that were broken, than by the actual harms done. Both of them assume it's the state that is the victim, and therefore, it's a state that ought to do justice. Both of them assume that the offender, the defendant, is the central focus of justice and victims are peripheral. The process is adversarial, so the outcomes are always win and lose, guilt or innocent, you know, guilty or not guilty. And victims and offenders' interests are assumed to be diametrically opposed to each other. Justice focuses on the act and the intent, but not on the contributing cause. Justice is done by professionals who represent the defendant, the state, society at large, but by the way, not victims. The focus of justice is on establishing guilt, meting out the punishment offenders deserve, and on the rights and processes involved. 
Well, maybe restorative justice can offer a third way, a, f a way that emphasizes repair and responsibility. In that view, in restorative justice view, crime is one of many harms and conflicts that ha happen in communities, and the responses to them shouldn't be so radically different, whether it's called a crime or whether it's not. The essence of wrongdoing is the harm that's done to individuals, to communities, to relationships, to trust. Justice should seek to repair the harm and hold offenders accountable for the harm by helping them take responsibility for it. And offenders can be encouraged to, take, to be accountable by taking responsibility. Such accountability, in this view, is often a better deterrent than punishment is. To the extent possible, those who have a stake in the harm and wrongdoing should be invited to participate in the, re in the resolution through collaborative processes. <clears throat> Victim and offender needs should equally be taken into account in the justice process. And victim and offender perspectives aren't necessarily diametrically opposed to each other. And in fact, win-win outcomes are even possible sometimes. Ideally, justice would address not only the act that was done and the consequences, but the causes of wrongdoing to help prevent this kind of thing in the future. In a restorative justice view, rights and security are both important, but so are needs and obligations. So the focus of justice is on reducing and repairing harm, encouraging responsibility for the harm, and engaging people in the process. I've had the luxury, I guess, of working in New Zealand quite often. Uh, I really like New Zealand. My, if, if my wife didn't keep reminding me we have grandkids, I would have wanted to move there, but anyway. Uh, but, and they have this really innovative approach to youth justice that is in many ways very restorative, and they were world leaders at it. And so I appreciated David Hackett Fisher's book, Fairness and Freedom, where he analyzed two open societies, the United States and New Zealand. He points out that historically, America has focused on liberty and freedom, while New Zealand has focused on fairness and equity. And you hear that in the politicians. I mean, you listen to the politicians of both countries, you hear that distinctly. Much more talk about fairness and equity in New Zealand. He argues that it ha it cur it's partly because of the people who colonized both the situations they were in when they came, but also how they interacted with the people that were already there, like the Maori in New Zealand. It's not an accident then that, restore that New Zealand is a world leader. Uh, I can tell you more about that story if you want. Liberty and freedom, he argues, are highly individualistic concepts. Fairness is based on a sense of reciprocity, a concern for each other, a concern for balance. So he argues that either one, uh, that both of those encourage us to look for a third way. He says, would it be possible to combine liberty and freedom with fairness and justice in an optimal way? That, he says, is a question of the 21st century. And I ask, could restorative justice be part of this mix or encourage this or facilitate this? I will note that all of this asks, by the way, raises questions of how we safeguard human rights in restorative processes, given that restorative processes are often less structured, less, in, less formal. And I don't have an easy answer for that, but New Zealand has been an inspiration to me. In New Zealand, what they have done is taken, you know, we have made the court as the default, so everything goes to court. New Zealand, they said, let's keep the court as a guarantee of due process and of human rights and to handle the cases that these restorative processes can't. But for serious crimes in New Zealand, except murder, you're supposed to go to what's essentially a restorative conference and sort it all out there. And only if you don't need to do that or can't decide, or if it's a certain complicated case, is it supposed to go to court. What, and in that process, that, well, the, the court, in a real serious case, the court has to approve that, make sure due process is followed. But it has a specially trained and selected attorney watching the process. It's not an adversarial process. I've sat in on the interviews of attorneys in New Zealand who want to be youth advocates. And believe me, it's easier to be a death penalty attorney in this country than it is to be a youth advocate in New Zealand. Uh, and the focus of that is to make sure due process is followed and the process is facilitated through that. That gives me some hope. 
1994, Fred Van Lu was bureau chief in the criminal bureau of the Polk County Attorney's Office. He was the chief prosecutor. And he read a disturbing, a disturbing case came in. Neo-Nazi graffiti had been found all over the local Jewish synagogue. And arrested, two people had been arrested, an 18-year-old young man and a 17-year-old woman. Fred says he had been irreparably damaged by reading my book, Changing Lenses, a couple of years before, and said, so he couldn't quite do things the old way. And so instead of asking the usual question of who did it and, you know, and what laws they break and how can they be punished, he started asking different questions. He started asking, what do people need and what is possible in this situation? He could have charged it as a felony hate crime, but he decided to approach it differently. So he went to the rabbi and some of the, some of the uh, folks from the synagogue, asked how they were doing, listened to the trauma they had felt. This had been really traumatizing. This was before all the stuff in the last few years. But some of the members were Holocaust survivors. It had been terribly, terribly uh, traumatizing and disruptive. They were angry, they were afraid, they were stuck. Fred described the restorative process uh, and, the, and uh, the rabbi said, well, it's consistent with our tradition, but I just don't know if people are gonna go for this. But they talked about it, they decided to go forward and they held a meeting. In that meeting, stories were told. People, they talked to, to these two young people about wh how this had impacted them and why. They poured out their stories and their grief and their fears. And they discovered these two offenders had stories too. The young man had been abused, he had a hearing problem, he had been bullied, he had run away from home, he had gone to Alabama, he joined up with the Aryan Nation, which finally gave him a family, and then sent him back to Iowa to recruit others. And the only person he'd been able to recruit was this 17-year-old young woman. After three hours of talk, he said, Fred says the self-awareness self gave way to awareness of the other. They became real people to each other instead of stereotypes and faceless boogeymen. The temple came to realize that these were really just lost, abused children. They talked about forgiveness, and the rabbi explained that in their tradition, forgiveness had to be earned. But the temple wanted these two to, to try, to, to succeed. So they agreed that these two young people would do 200 hours of community service to the temple, and they would meet weekly to study Jewish and Holocaust history, which the temple would teach. They also agreed the temple would help the young man find a hearing specialist, and that the young man would get these Nazi tattoos that he had on removed, and he and his girlfriend would get their GEDs and try to find jobs. And they planned on a second meeting in six months. These two young people worked hard. They gained confidence, they passed their GEDs, they got jobs, they got married, they had a child. When they had a wedding, they invited the synagogue and the, and the uh, rabbi, and they came bearing gifts. Almost five years later, the, Fred said, the rabbi spoke of the friendship with the two with tears in his eyes. System-wise, system -wise, the judge continued the case, and when it was done, entered it in order of deferring judgment, so neither would get criminal records. That's not the usual outcome of a hate crime and it's certainly not a failure for human rights. Empathy, honor, dignity, these were key to the civil rights movement. Can we structure our approach to human rights issues so that these are part of the process as well as the goal, so that there's consistency between the means and the ends? Like Michelle Alexander, many people today are calling for a new social movement to address mass incarceration and other issues of structural injustice. To do that is gonna require us to re-examine some of our assumptions and values. And again, that's what I see the primary value, the primary function of restorative justice, to have that, kind, to start that kind of conversation. When I set out to write Changing Lenses, I wasn't trying to write anything definitive. Rather, what I hoped to write was a provocative essay, one that would help to challenge us to, to think about our assumptions, assumptions that we take for granted, the common sense that we so often don't question. And I hope some of my comments tonight will help with that. Restorative justice certainly doesn't hold all the answers. 
my students used to, when they, I used to, there used to be an ad on Radio Shack, when Radio Shack was around, that said, uh, if you have questions, we have answers. And I always said, you have questions, I have questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I do think it can provoke us to, to rethink some of these things. Maybe we can hold up the kind of moral imagination that my former colleague and speaker here at the Lynch le Lectures, John Paul Lederox, argues is essential for transformation. We can only do that, though, if we approach the work with a recognition of the limits of what we know, a recognition of how our biographies, our ethnicity, our genders, our cultures, our privileges or lack of them shape our views. Only with such a recognition, only with this kind of humility, can we nurture the kind of world we dream for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Howard. That was just really uh, inspiring and comprehensive in terms of a lot of the, the bases that you've touched in your, in your work, as well as offering us some examples. I know for me, the, one of the questions that's been coming up a lot in classes, um, you, hit, you hit right at it, that relationship between indigenous approaches and a human rights discourse that's floating around the world and how those meet in sometimes uh, spaces of friction or other times um, come together in ways that intersect and create something very new. So I think uh, that's something that uh, I know a lot of uh, people in the audience have, have been thinking about. So thank you uh, for that and, and all the ideas you've offered us. I think we'll um, take some questions. We have people who are uh, going to be in the aisles holding microphones, so please uh, get their attention or make your way to the aisle if you can. Uh, we will take maybe about uh, 20 minutes of questions, and then we have a lovely reception in the room across the hall that, that you're all invited to. So uh, please, anyone? like to start us off? Thank you. Um, I think this gets really murky really fast, as much of what goes on in this uh, quote-unquote field. Because when you're talking about uh, uh, a legal system that's abusive and repressive, towards the poor and uh, uh, people who are really defenseless and are driven into these conditions. That's a very narrow area. Unfortunately, most of violence that takes place in our society is invisible. All hierarchical power relations are, uh, uh, are abusive and abuse is, has become part of the normal life cycle. So, and we have, we have a long way to go to build the infrastructure for accountability in those areas. If it wasn't for the Me Too movement, Weinstein still would be abusing women in large numbers and many men like that. So now we have actually a new dimension in accountability. I don't think uh, Weinstein should be uh, uh, treated like many, many kids in the uh, uh, ghetto are treated at all. But uh, how do we build these uh, uh, the, the systems of accountability so that then we can come to a point where we can uh, deal with uh, uh, forgiveness and so forth? Do you prefer one, one question, one answer? Do you want to collect a couple questions? It's completely up to you. Well, you're assuming I have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you would try. <laughs> well, I agree. It's really murky. What, what encourages me, though, I mean, my field has been largely the criminal justice applications of it. That's what I've worked in. But when I see my colleagues, you know, a new generation of where they're taking this work and using it to inform exactly those kind of questions, I get a lot of encouragement. So I think that 
the principles and values of it have a, have a lot of application that we're only beginning to dream of. Uh, so I'm encouraged by it, even though I think I agree it's really murky, and I don't have very easy answers on it. But there's some really interesting dialogues that have been going along with the MeT movement and parts of the restorative justice field, for instance, about what accountability could mean and, and so forth. And I think that's really encouraging. No, I think we better on this. We've got more on this side, so please, and then. So one of the problems that complicates things is the issue of uh, victimless crimes. And our drugs uh, laws are a classic example of that. The, the, this seems to be what you had mentioned, that the state seems to see itself as the victim. Uh, can you talk about what, how restorative justice may or may not apply here? Well, it's true that when we first were formulating this, we were thinking about crimes, and we were thinking about crimes where there are victims. But, you know, there are always harms involved. I, for instance, I, had a, I knew a prosecutor and a big city prosecutor who did a drug bust in the inner city, and then he had a circle process with the community that he was impacting, so they would have to hear how it was impacting the community, and, and the community could see how it was affecting them. I thought that was pretty creative. Uh, there are a number of places that are working with, with so-called victimless crimes, helping them to understand, helping people who've committed those kind of offenses to understand that there are implications for their families and other kinds of things. So I think there, are, even though the original models did have in mind something where there was a clear victim, uh, there are lots of applications for, where it can still be used. Mm -hmm. Is there a Fetterman in the back? Thank you. I'm so excited you're here. This was the subject of class last night, and Gregory Baldwin, who uh, does restorative justice throughout Alexandria, came to class. So we just had a, a great night talking about this. Um, the question I've been chewing on today, and I just thought it'd be so helpful. I am sold on this idea that shame doesn't work, and we talked about reintegrative shaming last night. Um, but I also work on corporate accountability. <laughs> and I notice I'm studying kind of the what makes them change. And shame, a public shaming of some sort seems to be the first step. And maybe this is what the Me Too was alluding, alluding to. And so on the one hand, I'm sold. On the other, I seem to think that it, it does get their attention. So any insight you have, because I'm in a bit of a pickle on that one. <laughs> well, shame is a fundamental human affect. I mean, some of the shame therapists say it's, it's more fundamental than some of the drives that we think are, are basic. Uh, Every, everybody, every human being feels shame. There are cultural differences in what causes it. There are cultural differences in how it's handled. So shame, uh, and so when we call people out, no matter how, how we do it, shame happens. I, I used to threaten to make a bumper sticker that said, shame happens. You know? uh, the, the question is whether we ought to be actively trying to impose shame. And the, the, there were some models of restorative justice that were based on shame theory where the facilitators were trained to actually cause shame. And the research is very mixed on that. And the best research is saying that's really dangerous. Shame is going to happen both to the person in, in a restorative conference, both the so-called victim and the so-called offender are dealing with shame even though they don't know it. The question is how do you manage and transform it? So uh, yeah, you call somebody out for what they did. There is going to be shame involved. but. The research is saying don't actively try to shame. That backfires almost all the time. It's a dangerous emotion. The focus ought to be on how you, trans, how you transform it. There's a story. I don't know if you have time for a quick story. That all, was all, fun, way back in our early days, we had a, a case where two young men got into a factory, and they took the fire extinguishers, and they just made a mess. 200 people were out of work. And they came to our program, and the uh, foreman of the factory read them the riot act and had them in tears. One was 14, one was 16. And he said, I wish you could come and clean it up and, ha and have to meet those people. We've already done that. But he said, I, I, what I want you to do is come and clean up the, na the vacant lot next door so you've done some work for us. And I want you to actually have to see the, meet the people you harmed. And they did it. And the last day, he said, well, bring your swimming suits. He took them to the owner's house. And they had a party and a, then a ceremony building, burning the contract. And those two young men were so proud of them. They, they really knew they had done something bad. But they were so proud of themselves for having faced up to it and done something right. And their teachers said you could almost graph the increase in their grades. <laughs>
that's, that's shame that's transformative. And so the shame happened when nobody had, I mean, the foreman reading of the riot act did use a kind of shame. That's going to happen. But how do you manage it? How do you transform it? Is it different, do you think, for corporations to do it on that big scale? Or does it get dangerous in different ways? Or? It probably has more value there. Braith one of the things Braithwaite did is to go on and work on corporations. Yeah, uh, he particularly wanted to see how he used his restorative process with corporations. So there's quite a literature yeah. that he's done yeah. with that. There you go. There you go. Still not seeing on this side. OK, I'm going to get way in the back in a minute. Marco, please. Coming to you. Howard um, Zimbardo and, and uh, Stanley Milgram and others were so good at graphing, bringing out the worst of us and how to do it. <laughs> and you, you have been witness to, because of your own methodologies, bringing out the best in people and those transformative moments. And I'd just like to know what your insights are on what that moment is like and what is it like on a psychic, psychosocial level? How do you explain it as a lesson for who we are and what our potential is? You know, I think when I did that book, I interviewed with life sentence prisoners. I interviewed 75 men and women. I never asked them, but almost every one of them told me about, they say things like, you know, every night I think about what I did, I th and I don't know what to do about it. And so one of the things that happens in these things is a chance for someone to, do, to take responsibility, but also they can see the impact on the person when they answer the person who's been harmed when they answer questions when even if the person uh, well I'll give you a case example one time we, another person and I were facilitating a serial rape case this fellow had attacked 14 young women in a year's time under the age of 18 and he was had been in prison for a long time and one of the women wanted to face meet him and she said I just want to tell him what he did to my life I want him to know that they sent my descent to drugs, and my, you know, just everything that happened. Uh, and he'd been there a long time. He'd been through a lot of therapy, but he was clearly, when I talked to him, wasn't getting it. Well, in that meeting, she said to him at some point, uh, she said, you stole my childhood. He said that a couple times, and I saw him start to tear up. Later, he told me, he said, that's the first time I'd ever understood what I did. I've been through all their therapy. I had never understood because I lost my childhood when my father began to beat me and my mother left and so forth. Uh, and she said, you know, she said she didn't have any questions, but she did. <clears throat> and after, toward the end of it, I asked her, I said, you know, you've waited all these years. You've come all this way. Are you getting what you want? She said, I'm at peace now. For the first time, I can think about it when I want to, and I, don't have, and I cannot think about it when I want to. So, you know, it was a really hard. He told me afterwards, that's the hardest thing I ever did in my life. But I can tell that I did some good. And if anybody else wants to meet me, I'm willing to do it. So that need to make, you know, the research around people who've offended, who turned their lives around, one of the keys to it is finding a way to do good. Uh, and so many of the lifers, those lifers, I went back two years ago. I got permission to go back to 22 of those men and women still in prison because Pennsylvania is full life sentence. And so many of them, we asked them what was keeping them. They were finding ways to do good. They were training service dogs for the community. They were, they were peer, uh, certified peer specialists. They were, they were just doing all kinds of things. So the, ch the chance to do something good is, is part of that. And it's kind of a rambling answer, but anyway, oh, hope we got it. Way in the back. Blue sweater. No, okay, person who has their hand up. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So I just had a question oh, on um, implementing restorative justice practices on violent crimes because I've done some research, like, for example, drug courts, and they kind of had a dubiety towards taking people who were into drugs but had violent records opposed to people who had violent list records. So I wanted to see like your approach on transforming a narrative on that. Well, a lot of the programs in this country until recently for really violent crimes have been only available for 
when the person's in prison and the person who's been harmed wants to meet with them. Uh, but there are the things are changing, uh, and in Canada that's not as true. And uh, and New Zealand for for serious crime except murder or manslaughter, you're supposed to go to a conference. Uh, he, he, it's only for serious crimes. In the lesser crimes, the police aren't supposed to bring them go through the process at all. Um, so obviously there have to be a lot of safeguards and and things like that. But I think the research suggests that in some ways the more serious the wrong, the more transformative the process. Uh, there's a there are some groups that Impact Justice in California is doing pioneering work based on the New Zealand model to keep young people out of the system entirely, and they're taking serious crimes. So in other words, whereas a lot of the programs rely on person getting arrested and getting into the system, they particularly started wanting to keep kids of color out of the system entirely, and they they got agreements with the prosecutors that they could use what they call used to call the reverse Miranda warning. They were able to say to the people. No, whatever you say in here will not be used against mm -hmm. you. And they bring together supporters, victim supporters, defender supporters, and so forth. And they've had dramatic in decreases in recidivism uh, as a result. So there's some really innovative things being done. It's the thing that the hardest thing is just the politics of convincing people yeah. to take a chance on it. Um, right behind Lauren. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Professor yeah. Zare. Thank you for your very illuminating lecture. I meant to ask you about what is your thought uh, about restorative versus retributive justice? Is it true that you changed your mind about those two not being polar <laughs> opposites? It intrigued me. It seems like you're in the, in the business of developing academic humility as opposed to academic ego, and it impresses me. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> well, uh, when I wrote cha when, when I was wrote changing lenses, I, I was really this whole thing started this movement. There's a lot of different streams into it, but you know, we most of the literature traces it back to a particular case in Ontario, Canada, in 1974, where I can tell you the story if you want, but. And then we picked it up in northern Indiana. And as I was trying to explain what we're doing, I began to find found these different streams of thought and trying to bring them together. And my self-concept has been I'm, I consider myself a journalist of justice. So I'm a communic I set out very young to be a communicator, to learn to communicate. And I wanted to I wanted to interpret justice. To, and so I was looking for language that would connect. And so retributive and then for a long time, I couldn't figure out where I found the word restorative, except that Ann Skelton is a human rights lawyer in, uh, in South Africa. And she was working on her PhD, and she came to my office, and I turned her loose. And she found this book with an essay about restitutive justice. It was a little bit like restorative justice. But there was a series of terms in one line, and there was the term restorative justice was in there, and I had underlined it. And that's where I got it. So I, I use those words partly because they alliterated, you could remember them and so <laughs> forth. But then later, uh, a philosopher of law took me on and he said, you know, you are so missing it. When you say the retributive and restoration, retribution restoration are opposite, you are cutting off all kinds of possibilities for conversation. Because he said, if you think of retribution as a philosophy, not just as a gut reaction, as a philosophy, both retributive justice and restorative justice say that there's a debt involved, something is owed, the victim is owed some, it says the offender, the one who caused the harm, owes something. Either they have to be taken seriously as a, as a moral agent, so something has to happen. The difference is in the currency that will balance it. Retribution says it's punishment. Uh, re restoration says it's an active effort to, to repair, to restore. And so that opened up all kinds of possibilities for conversation when you begin to realize there's a lot to, we have in common in those philosophies. So I have gone away from the language of retribution just partly because it, it, it isn't totally accurate either. I mean, many people in the legal system have lots of good intentions. Uh, they're often very frustrated with their jobs. I've, I've met so many judges and prosecutors and, and defense attorneys that are so... I've had former students go on to law school against my advice and then quit. <laughs> uh, because, but because there are a lot of people who want to try to do some good in the, in the legal system too. So to count it purely as retributive isn't fair. 
Does that answer the question? <laughs> it, it, I think the direction you went is good because restitutive is, is a hard one to say. I, I think we're better off yeah. with restorative. That's, right. the That's problem just a with hard one. The problem with restoration, restorative, just everybody thinks they immediately, instinctively know what it means. Yeah. And of course, it's a lot more. Mennonites, are, which I am, is really bad at that. Because we think we're a peace church, so everybody hears restorative justice, they think they know what it is. They don't. But mm. anyway. Mm. Mm. And Alan, yeah. Thank you. Uh, do you see restorative uh, we'll justice come back to this here. as a way to approach this argument we're having in the country about reparations for slavery? And do you see, for example, Ferguson, Missouri, uh, after Michael Brown was killed, and, uh, and everybody rioted for months and months and months, and then what happened in Ferguson or what is happening in Ferguson is restorative justice. So the, the fines that the town was living off of because Michael Brown, when he was asked by a cop what his name was, and he said Mike, and he was fine because his name is Michael, see? And uh, so the uh, people in Missouri uh, decided in that one town uh, to give restorative justice. Do you see that as restorative justice, and what's wrong with it? <laughs> yeah, I don't have an answer for that. No, it's a lot more complicated. That part of the, again, part of the problem with the restorative justice is that we hear as I said earlier, every intervention is going to have unintended consequences. Everyone is going to be co-opted. And we see that term being co-opted for so many things that aren't really restorative. That, that really complicates things uh, and discredits the field in a lot of ways. Your first question, uh, I think reparations. the reparations question, I think it, 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 add, it adds a whole new possible dimension to talk about reparations in with uh, with restorative justice folks, and some of my colleagues are working on that kind of thing. You know, it gets us beyond some of the legalities. It begins to realize the importance of listening to people's stories, the understanding the historical harms, giving people space in there to define their own needs and so forth. So I think it adds some really important dimensions to it, but I can't give you a blueprint for it. But I think it, I think it has a lot of potential. Yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna go this way, to Hema, and then. Thank you so much for this talk. It's given me a lot to think about. Um, when I hear the term restorative justice, I also often hear about prison abolition. And so I'm wondering how you think about prison abolition. Um, some people might assume that you would be, you know, say, let's get rid of the prisons, but maybe that's not the case. Maybe there's a place for prisons, and if that's the case, what role should they play, in your opinion? I can't quite envision a world without something like prisons. They don't have to be the way they are here. They, you know, you've all seen some of the Scandinavian models and so forth that aim at allowing people to live as normally as possible so that they can make the reentry. But I know people, I mean, I, I, I have friends inside that'll tell me they need to be there, that they, they won't be safe on the outside. So I don't, I think it's an important conversation. I think we really need to look at the way Prisons are misused, and, and but in my own view, I can't quite imagine a world without something way to keep people away from us, at least for a while. Uh, does that make sense? So uh, it's still going to be everything. Everything is open to misuse. It's going to be misused, but yeah, I, 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 we need a place to keep a space for people. To, to be away and and keep the, keep us safe, uh, but not in the kind of conditions we do it. They're so opposite of what we want people to be. Um, yeah. I can. I mean, I can. I, yeah. No, go ahead. So I think what I'll do is take a few questions, and then you can 
answer one, several, or, or none, and we'll at least have heard. <laughs> and uh, we're, we'll be moving toward, toward uh, closing up. So I'll take maybe four or five. I know you've had your hand way, way up. Yeah. Possibly in front of the camera, but that's okay. So can we get a mic? You know, that's, I think we, we've identified. Just wait for the mic. Well, I really like and enjoy your concepts of restorative justice, but my question is, is this not very similar to the concept of tikkun olam? of the Jewish philosophy, because tikkun olam is to, to repair what is wrong, to repair what the damage you have done. It, it, uh, it goes related to tohu, tohu is chaos, and the way of resolving chaos is through tikkun olam, to repair the wrong that you have done. Do you see any difference in which you are explaining with this tikkun olam concept that is very old? OK, so we'll take a, a couple of others. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Ask it quick, and, and then we'll, we'll All right. Pass Hello. Thank you. Thank you for being here. My name is Fatima. I'm a student here at SCAR. Um, the question I have is that I understood that oftentimes people who are participating um, in restorative justice uh, begin the process perhaps begr begrudgingly. And whose role is it and for how long are they to motivate and inspire to, to go through the process and see it till the end? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. Um. All right, uh, I'm going to make it quick. I've, I've got two questions. Since we're talking about uh, a lot of, a lot of re-words, I'm going to introduce two more re-words. Uh, one of them is, we touched upon it, which is restitution, and which is if you're going to fix harm, there's a, there needs to be a form of, be it financial or symbolic, restitution uh, to the person that's identified harmed. And what's your take on that, and how do you see it within the restorative justice process. And the other one is a lot of movements, including restorative justice and all the others, do recognize that this, the, the issue is structural, the issue is systemic. But I don't see a lot of confidence in going as far as being revolutionary in terms of changing the system or shocking the system or uh, talking about the root cause of the system. So what are your takes on these two rewords uh, in relation to your uh, book? So, so we'll do these last three people. I'm not sure I can remember all this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Well, we're just being heard, because I, I don't think we've got the time, but I thought audience members should be heard. And they can uh, find, he can find you afterwards. Yeah. Good evening, Professor Zare. Um, I was wondering if um, you've ever heard of, um, is this thing called the Victims Booklet by the International Criminal Court? Um, and um, so uh, the way that um, this fits in, I think, um, with the ICC, you have you know pr preliminary examination, pretrial, trial, eventual appeals, and then there is a um, a section at the end which I forget now what's it called exactly. But they try to fit in a lot of what we talked about today, and um, I was wondering if you think that could be. Um, a way to start to um, address um, how we can implement restorative justice. And in that sense, do you think there are more opportunities uh, regionally or internationally? Mm -hmm. You okay? <laughs> do, do these last two and then it's up to you, please. Uh, good evening. I'm an SCAR student and prior to being a student here, I worked for 14 years at the Arlington County Detention Center. And so I understand very well how hard it is to be a humanitarian when you're working within the criminal justice system. And I have, my question for you really is what guidance or advice you might give to people who are working within the system but who feel as you do towards restorative justice and the idea of human dignity and respect and all of that and who try to live that out in their interaction with inmates 
and they face a lot of resistance. In my case, for example, I, inter I was there working full time for 14 years on a daily basis interacting with the people who were incarcerated there because I managed the education program for the men and women who were incarcerated right here in Arlington. And just one small example is that when I had a meeting with our, our sheriff, Beth Arthur, and I made reference in the meeting, just between the two of us, I made reference to my students because I was there as a teacher, so of course they were my students. I was admonished to never call them students because in fact they are inmates. And so this is an example of the kind of institutional resistance that we as humanitarians working in the criminal justice system face on a regular basis. And on occasion, our jobs are at risk because of being humanitarians. And so I ask you for what sort of guidance or advice you might give to folks like us who work in that field that are working for change ever so incrementally to change the normative values within those systems. And last but not least. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you, and this Susan, something to think about too, uh, what would it be like to uh, impose a gender lens on top of all this discussion as well? So not only in terms of say, where does this, if you impose the gender lens on the field, where does this fit in within that? But also if concepts like shame or, or other, other f factors within the system um, have a gendered nature that would be helpful in any way. Wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to have a go at any, any oh of those? Or <laughs> it's a lot. Or, or anything else you want to say? I'm trying to think where to start. Some ideas for your next books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that let me start with my, one of the questions over here about it really people have to decide for, for facilitated cases, for conferencing cases. People have to decide they want to do it. And there are different times. I mean, I've, I've known many people who for years didn't want anything to do with this and suddenly they needed to do it. Uh, so you really have to work. And, and people who've been victimized always are the gatekeepers. You never do it if they don't want to do it. Uh, so they need to think about, we try to sit with both sides, think about the possibilities and also the dangers. We think about what the needs are, what, what they need to happen in it, what they need to be safe in the process, and all of that kind of thing. So it takes, particularly with the more serious kinds, I, I hate to word, use the word serious because so-called minor offenses can be pretty traumatic to people. But uh, violent crimes, for instance, you really, you really uh, have to do a lot of, lot of work w with people. But it is really interesting that people will say, I don't, want, I don't need this, I don't want to do this. Uh, one of the people in my book, the victim book, one of the, one of the people had gone through a process, well, she had, she had experienced a rape when she had just been married, and it just really, the next 20 years of her life, she said, was just, just totally impacted by that. Um, and then she began to work with the program and she exchanged letters with the fellow who did it and she felt much better about it. And I asked her, I said, would you ever think about meeting with him? I said, no, I, have, I don't need to do that. I, you know. Well, about a month later, I get this email from her. She says, you know, you got me thinking. I decided I wanted to meet him. And instead of going to the program and doing all, all the preparation, she goes to the prison. Uh, and the prison called the program and said, what should we do? And they said, you know, she's really strong. Let him meet. And she said, I, he walked down the hall to me. I had absolutely no fear. Uh, but it was, it was years later that she decided she wanted to do that. So it really needs to be flexible. It needs to be there throughout the process uh, for whenever people are ready for it. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've discovered is that most religious traditions have resonance with parts of restorative justice. My, you know, I've had the luxury of having students from many, many different faith traditions. And my Muslim students have gone back, looked at their tradition, and they find restorative elements there. And, and my Jewish students have done the same. And uh, that's one of the encouraging things about it, is it provides a dialogue with some basic values that, that get, get lost sometimes. <laughs>
Yeah. I'll take a stab at the gender gender lens. I think especially, and, and I think when you think about a gender lens, we can think about a lens of racial justice as well. I think in some of the um, recent studies and critiques, given the, the proliferation of restorative practices in, across schools, just to take that, um, some of the research on what's happening forces us to really take a gender lens and a racial justice lens because we see some of the same inequalities um, coming out as come out in a punitive model. And so I think it's sort of encouraging uh, bringing those those ways of thinking together, you know, multiple lenses uh, together. I don't know if you've had that experience as well. And, and sort of, I'm curious sort of what you're thinking about the spread of these processes and practices throughout so many institutions. Yeah, it's, real, it's just exciting things. I just never imagined the application. It's just so, it's so exciting to see a new generation of people just taking these places that I just never, Never yeah. dreamed of. Yeah. 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 I, I think we will encourage you to uh, approach Professor Zier in the reception. Can I ask you to come up, uh, Alp? And we just um, have one more thing that we'll do before we, we say good night. Yeah. I wonder if you could help sure. me to do this. To, Professor Zare, so we just have something to thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. You're the whole thing. That was good.